I want to talk to you about family matters because our families matter. Family is important in that it shapes our identities, uh, gives us a sense of security and provides the support we need to succeed outside. When things at home are good, you will find that you are happier, more confident, more stable. A strong family is vital to our well-being and success. What contributes to a strong family? I think first, members must be able to forgive one another for the wrongs they commit. Otherwise, that will cripple the relationship. The second thing that helps to build a family is love. I think we can all agree that one of the most important ingredients for a thriving family is love. After all, family is a place where you expect to be full of love and to be loved unconditionally. Deep, lifelong love for each other should be what defines spouses, siblings, parents and their children. However, we know from painful experience that the love that exists in our families is very often conditional, fleeting and self-centered. Why is it so? What makes loving our family members so difficult sometimes? Because even though home is where we are loved the most, it is also where we act the worst. Because even though home is where we are loved the most, it is also where we act the worst. Meaning we see their worst sides. Not just that, we are also at the receiving end of it. Home is where we get irritated most easily by the things our family members do or fail to do. It is where we let off steam after a hard day at school or work. It is where we take off the nice front and image that we put up for outsiders and become unrestrained with our words and actions. That's why we find our family members so unlovable sometimes. And they feel the same about us too. That being said, we still want them to love us. And it is actually our desire to love them instead of hurting them. It takes intention and effort to love our families but it will be worth it because love begets love. When you start to show love, no matter how unlovable your family members are, you set up a virtuous cycle in which they learn to love in return. And choosing to love them means you won't live in regret and guilt for not treating them as you ought and truly wanted to. So how do we love our families? Today, I want to refer to a, a book in the Bible called Ruth. To appreciate the book of Ruth, we need to read it in context with the book before it, which is the book of Judges. The book of Judges records a very depressing period in Israel's history when God's people rebelled against him repeatedly. The verse that summarizes all 21 chapters in Judges is the last verse which says, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. By doing as they saw fit, the Israelites even ended up going into a civil war. They fought and killed their own brothers. And then, when you turn over the page to the next book, Ruth, although it only has four chapters, it paints a happy contrast to the spirit of the times. Ruth tells of a few individuals who chose to live their lives differently, who did not do what was right in their own eyes, but what was right in God's eyes. What stood out especially about them was the way they loved their family members. The story of Ruth starts on a very bleak note. Let's read from chapter 1, verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moab women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. 
The book of Ruth teaches us how we can continue to build strong and thriving families, even in a culture in which families around us are breaking down, marriages are falling apart, and parents are losing control over their children. There's hope. It's possible to build great families even in this environment. Although this story starts with multiple tragedies in Naomi's family, God worked through her and various other characters to provide a new family for her and a happy ending. Today, we'll look at the roles played by three persons and learn from their examples. First, Naomi. From her, we learn that loving your family requires sacrifice. We are all familiar with the word sacrifice, but there are two parts to its meaning. And what most of us commonly refer to is the first part, which is to surrender or give up something that is valuable and desirable to us. We like to talk and even feel proud about the sacrifices we have made, the precious things we have given up. But the second part explains why the sacrifice has been made. It is done for the sake of something else, which is considered as having an even higher value. That's what sacrifice truly is and what loving means. The giving up of our rights, preferences, resources for the sake of our family members' needs, happiness and success. The Israelites in the period of the judges are a reflection of our natural tendency to put ourselves first. That's why they did as they saw fit, disregarding God's commands and the well-being of their fellow countrymen they were more concerned about fulfilling their own agenda. We are like that too. Each of us has a personal agenda of our own lives, and we expect everyone, especially our family members, to understand us, meet our needs, accommodate us, and yield to us at the expense of themselves, because we naturally see our needs as far more pressing and important than theirs. Here's where Naomi stands in contrast to us. Let's continue the story from verse 6. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Why did Naomi tell them not to follow her? In Old Testament times, a widow's plight was extremely desperate. Without the support of a husband and sons, a widow would have no one to provide for her. Very often, she would end up a slave or prostitute. What's more, Naomi was in a foreign land. The next closest person she could turn to were her Moabite daughters-in-law. Ancient Middle Eastern culture expected individuals to prioritize their families and regarded fulfilling obligations to family of utmost importance. Under such dire circumstances, Naomi could have rightly and naturally demanded for Orpah and Ruth to remain with her and provide for her. Yet Naomi did the very opposite. Why didn't Naomi ask Orpah and Ruth to follow her? Naomi was more concerned about Orpah and Ruth than herself. She knows that the community in Judah will not welcome them because Israelites detest Moabites. Remarriage holds the greatest promise for a full and secure life for them. But the chances for that in Israel were practically nil for the two of them. Following Naomi would require them to renounce all hope and effectively consign them to the life of a poor widow. Therefore, Naomi urges them to return to their own homes, even though that means Naomi will travel home completely alone and must fend for herself. She forgoes her interests for the sake of Opa and Ruth's happiness. Just last week, someone's sacrifice made all the difference for a family member too, but this time between life and death. What happened was a local influencer and streamer, Ng, was playing an intense round of Valorant 
mostly by the people in the first service, this game. It's uh, actually a first-person shooter game. She was talking to another team player when she heard a sound behind her. When she realized something was amiss, she told her teammates, wait, wait, my father not feeling well, and abruptly left the game. Ng attended to her father and realized he was having difficulties breathing. She called for an ambulance, and her father was taken to the hospital. He was found to have suffered a heart attack, and his heart even stopped once. But the doctors managed to resuscitate him. Gamers will know that it is an absolute no-no to leave a game halfway, because that will ruin the team's chances of winning and make everyone hate you. Ng herself said, I'm sorry if you were my teammates, in a video she uploaded after the incident. But imagine what would have happened to Ng's father if she did not stop her game. In the same video, Ng also said, I threw the game, but saved my dad's life. Your family members may not be having a heart attack, but what we do for them can make a world of difference. Knowing that family relationships have an even greater potential for conflict than other relationships, God gave clear commands in the Bible for each family member. Husbands are to love your wives as you love your own bodies. Wives are to respect the leadership position of your husbands. Children are to obey your parents in everything. Fathers are not to exasperate your children. There is to be no sexual contact of any kind between immediate family members. All these commands share one thing in common. Have you noticed what it is? They all prioritize the other party's need, such as the wife's need for love, husband's need for respect, and parents' need for submission. There will invariably be competing interests between different members. If one or both insist on their own ways, then conflict is inevitable. Conflict can be avoided only if one person is willing to sacrifice his or her own personal interests. The question is, will you be that person? When you are watching your favorite show and your parent needs your help with something at that moment, will you pause the show or put off their request? When a child wakes up crying, both you and your spouse are tired, who will be the one to attend to the child? When the family needs someone to run an errand, who will be the one to volunteer? If you are caught in one of these situations, will you be the person that says, I will put your interests before mine? Will you be the one who chooses to make the sacrifice rather than expect the other person to do it? Loving your family, firstly, requires sacrifice. And secondly, we learn from Ruth that loving your family requires loyalty. While sacrifice is about us putting the needs of our family members above ours, loyalty is about being committed to doing that in good times and especially in bad. It is easy to do good to our families when they are on their best behavior when they are nice to us, and when things at home are peaceful. But it's the last thing on our minds when somebody keeps making mistakes or when the stakes are high. Many people, instead of trying to work out their differences, they work out on their families. But loyalty means not giving up on our family even during tough times. When Naomi urged Opa and Ruth to return home, they had to make a decision whether to stay in Moab or to go to a land that they had never known. It makes sense for them to go back to their people, their old customs and culture and their old gods. They have a reasonable chance of remarrying and starting anew. You cannot fault them for wanting to stay behind. However, Ruth chose to do the opposite. Verse 16, but Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. 
These words of Ruth are so stirring that they have been used often in wedding vows. Few of us would love our mothers-in-law like that. But Ruth is different. She has great compassion for Naomi, seeing that she had lost not only her husband, but both of her sons. What may not be obvious to us is that Ruth is making a formal vow. She expresses her loyalty to Naomi with a solemn oath, calling judgment upon herself if she ever leaves Naomi. She makes a lifelong commitment to Naomi. One of the greatest displays of loyalty I see is in football fans. Since the day I knew my husband, he has been supporting one football club. He watches their matches at unearthly hours. He follows their news and is very concerned about what's happening to them, to the extent of posting comments on their social media. He can't bear to throw away a super old and worn out jersey. But what really impresses me is how he has not given up on them. Even though the last I checked, they have not won the league for 18 years. <laughs> I always ask him, how come you're still supporting them? To that, he says, when you support a football club, you don't change. <laughs> I recently found out that since coming across Arsenal in a newspaper article during his secondary school days, it was love at first sight and for the rest of his life. It seems like I am the one who is encouraging him to be a fair weather fan. Even though the team always lets him down, he still cheers them on and believes in them. If we can be so devoted to our favourite football clubs, our favourite brands, and for my youth, their favourite celebrities, when they are losing or not performing well, shouldn't we be even more devoted to our families? We should stay by our family members to comfort them when they have made a mistake, offer help when they are in trouble, and encourage them when they are down. Again and again. That's what loyalty looks like. After all, there are no other people or groups that are for life. The friends we hang out with change with our life phases. There's no guarantee that any friendship will last forever. Even in church, we change cell group from time to time. But because of our biological ties, we are bound to our family for life. God has designed families uniquely this way so that we will be there to see each other through every season. We love our family members for as long as we both shall live, not as long as we both shall love. We make a commitment to love for a lifetime. Loyalty means loving when it is difficult to keep on loving. It means taking care of your parents when instead of being useful to you, they become senile, no longer able to take care of themselves. It means doing what is best for your spouses when you feel that he or she is not meeting your needs. It means accepting and believing in your children even when they are rebellious and break your heart. It even means respecting your mother-in-law no matter how difficult you feel she is. Loyalty means loving your family members even though there seems to be no longer any good reason to do so simply because they are family. Naomi shows us that loving our families requires sacrifice. And Ruth shows us it requires loyalty. The last character we turn to is Boaz. And what Boaz teaches us is loving your family requires extravagance. Very often when our family members ask us to do something for them, we just do the bare minimum or least required. Why? Because we want to preserve our time, energy, and money for ourselves. That actually is not love. Or rather, it doesn't show that we love them. For our family members to know that we love them, it requires us to go out of our way to make a special effort for them, even if it means a high cost to ourselves, or doing something that we will not ordinarily do. With Ruth's decision made, Ruth and Naomi set out for Judah together. To provide for her mother-in-law and herself, Ruth goes to other people's fields each day to gather food during the harvest. Israelite law commanded landowners to leave behind some of their produce so that the poor could come and pick it up. This is where Boaz comes into the picture. Ruth ends up picking grain in Boaz's field. When Naomi heard of it, she was excited. 
because Boaz was a potential kinsman redeemer. At that time, the law of Israel was that a man was required to marry his deceased brother's wife in order to enable the deceased brother to continue his family line. Not only that, if his deceased brother's land had been sold away to pay for debts, the man was obliged to purchase the land back and return it to his deceased brother's widow. That's why he's called a kinsman redeemer. Although this was the law, Obviously, it had not happened in Naomi's case. Elimelech's closest male relative, who was supposed to act as the kinsman redeemer, had chosen not to fulfill his responsibility, which was why Naomi was left without any land. Moreover, even if the kinsman redeemer had been willing to do so, Naomi would be too old to bear any more sons. That's why hope arises in Naomi's heart when she hears that Boaz had shown kindness to Ruth when she went to his fields. He was not the closest male relative and therefore had no legal obligation to be a kinsman redeemer. However, there was the possibility that he might be willing to take up the responsibility voluntarily. To cut a long story short, Naomi asked Ruth to approach Boaz and requests that he acts as a kinsman redeemer. How do you think he will respond? Boaz responded favorably, but he knows that there is a closer male relative who is supposed to redeem Naomi and her family's property. That man had to be consulted before Boaz could take Ruth as a wife. Boaz met with the other relative, and this was what happened. We jump to Ruth chapter 4, verse 3. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, which means the same thing, kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, Then I cannot redeem it, because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Initially, the man thought that the acquisition of additional property would be a good idea. Not only will he get more land, Naomi had no sons to inherit it, which means eventually he will get it anyway. But after accepting the offer, Boaz points out to him that he must also marry Ruth and enable her to have children. That's when he quickly backed down, saying it would endanger his own estate. What does he mean? Basically, he's saying he's not prepared to spend a lot of money to buy a piece of property that will end up belonging to another family, namely Naomi and Ruth's family. As Singaporeans, I believe we can all understand his reluctance. How many of you would be prepared to buy a property and give it away to your relative? It's a heavy burden to bear, and he was not willing to bear it, even though he was required to under the law. Boaz did the exact opposite. He was not obliged to fulfill the law or bear the burden, but he chose to do it out of the generosity of his heart. Why did he do it? Ultimately, Boaz did it because he wanted to honour God. He went beyond the law in an act of great extravagance. He did not do it to get anything out of it for himself. However, God chose to honour him because he had honoured God. Boaz married Ruth the kin as the kinsman redeemer and they had a son named Obed. Obed later became the grandfather of King David and an ancestor of Jesus Christ. So, Boaz had the privilege of becoming the great-grandfather of the future and greatest king of Israel and eventually, many centuries later, of the Lord Jesus himself. And that is why we are reading about his stories thousands of years later. God used him not only to help Naomi and Ruth, but also to play a part in God's salvation plan for the world. When you look at how Boaz loved Naomi's family so selflessly and generously, don't you wish that you have a family member who will love you this way too? 
Imagine going back to a home where the people, instead of always harping on your thoughts, they seek to help you, even at great cost to themselves. Wouldn't you feel so loved? The good news is the Bible tells us that we all have a kinsman redeemer, someone who saved us at great cost to himself. This person is Jesus. He is our true kinsman redeemer. What he redeems us from is not simply hardships in life, but our greatest problem, spiritual bankruptcy and eternal separation from God. We need Jesus to act as our kinsman redeemer because we can't help ourselves out of this problem. Like Boaz, he had no legal obligation to do so, but he voluntarily chose to do it in extravagant love. Jesus went out of his way and all the way to the cross, not under any pressure or compulsion, but because he loves us. His love for us made him seek the best for us. His love for us enabled him to endure the worst pain on the cross. He refused to give up on us. That's why when we look at the cross, it tells us without a shadow of doubt that Jesus loves us because the cross is the most extravagant display of love there can ever be. When we accept and internalize this love, it becomes the motivation for us to love our family, uh, extravagantly as well. Last week, I said I prepared this series not because I come from a perfect family. Instead, my family has its fair share of problems, just like yours. I've always attributed the problems to one bigger problem, my father. As I grew up and discovered his many flaws and vices, I started disliking him. He treated my mother very badly, he scolds vulgarities, uh, drinks, smokes, gamble, to the point he did not pay for our bills. Most of our expenses were settled by my mother and he does not help with housework. I could not bring myself to speak a kind word to him. I despised him for being a lousy husband and father. My parents fought frequently. I fought frequently with my father. I had nothing to talk to him about. And even when I did, it always ended up in a heated argument. Everything he did hurt me. Amid all this, my mother always laments that she married the wrong person. Everything about the family just felt wrong. Until someone reached out to my mother and introduced Christ to her. After that, her lament became, I married the wrong person, but I can't get a divorce because that's not what God wants. And she tried her best to treat my dad well. I, on the other hand, thought my mother was being too nice and my father doesn't deserve it. The ultimate thing my mother did was she paid for a holiday to Japan for the both of them. What's more, she kept it a surprise for him until the day they flew off. I couldn't comprehend why she brought my father, not me, on the trip. <laughs> Thankfully, God was gracious to me Despite my hatred for my father, he spoke patiently to me time and again to forgive him. With great difficulty, I prayed to forgive my father, not once, but many, many times. Eventually, I feel less hatred and more at peace with him. But that did not mean I love him. If forgiveness is moving me from the, on the scale from negative to neutral, the love is moving me to the positive zone, which, again, I found difficult to do because it feels so unnatural and awkward to show love to my dad. But when I look at my mother, I can't help to be moved. She is the one who has suffered the most. If she can love him by God's grace, so can I. Many years ago, Pastor Dad challenged me to show love to my dad in an extraordinary way, have breakfast with him. He explained that otherwise, how will your dad know you love him? Every cell in my body cringed at the suggestion. However, the idea wouldn't go away, and I eventually gave in. One Sunday morning, I told my dad, let's have breakfast at the coffee shop. He reluctantly agreed. Guess what happened? While parking his car, which is his most treasured possession, I knocked into the vehicle beside. He became furious and blamed me for this lousy idea. Now I also became angry. 
He drove off, I walk off on my own. Loving is so hard. Such failed and frustrating attempts to love him continued over the years. Difficult and tiring as it is, the relationship with my dad did slowly improve. My family was healing. Or so I thought. Because tragedy struck once more last year when my dad fell prey to a Chinese official impersonation scam and lost close to all his retirement savings, a huge sum. I was prepared that this time my mother will really call it quits. Things at home were a mess. But once more, my mother stayed by his side. Just last month, we were caught by surprise when my dad was diagnosed with rectal cancer and required surgery. It was a major operation that lasted eight hours. As a result, he has to use a stoma bag. Initially, my mother and I had opted for the easiest solution for his care, which is to order tingkat and hire a private nurse to change the bag. However, after a while, we, we, we changed our minds and decided to care for him ourselves, even though it has been a very trying period emotionally. My mom would prepare food in the morning before leaving for work, and I would learn how to change the bag for him. Thankfully, our efforts to love him has been paying off. He's now more appreciative of us and helps out in the family. He has quit most of his bad habits. Our relationship has improved. We can hold a conversation and sit through a meal together. This was previously unthinkable. Most importantly, he used to be super against Christianity, but is attending our Chinese services now. Love really changes heart. Praise the Lord. So I share my personal experience to say that you know, love really changes hearts. In fact, it is the most powerful and lasting tool to melt hardened hearts, to restore broken relationships and imperfect families. At the end of it all, for many years, I kept all these family matters a secret. I believe many of you struggle with your own family issues. And maybe, like me, you might not even have told others about them because you felt too ashamed or hopeless. You don't see how anything can change. However, what the Bible shows us is that God can intervene in our families. And He can give us the strength to be the person who starts to make a difference in our families. With God's help, you can change things in your family. And who knows, you may even lead them to Christ so that you will not just have a happy family on earth, but you will be together with them for all eternity. So as we bring this message to a close, I want to pray for those of you who wish to, or even just try to love your family members. The journey may be hard and long, but obeying God in His commands will bring about blessings. All it takes is one person in the family to choose to love and it will create a ripple effect. God will honour your obedience.